Thank you very much, Nick. Um, so when Nick asked me to give this talk, I was, I was a little bit um, uh, uncertain because although much of my research involves working with nanomaterials and devices, particularly in the context of, of healthcare delivery, um, talking more generally about nanotechnology can, can be quite a, a, a challenge, particularly if you've got about half an hour to do it in. So, so what I'm going to give you is a very... Um, superficial in many ways views of nanotechnology, putting my prejudices on display and, and hoping just to, to whet your appetite uh, uh, for, for what this science and this technology can do, which is really about engineering materials and devices, I've said on a small scale, on, on a very small scale. So nano is derived from the Greek word for dwarf and has been used for many years in, in a scientific and engineering context where it simply means 10 to the minus 9, a billionth of something. So if we talk about a nano something, we mean a billionth. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. A nanosecond is a billionth of a second. So, so nano as, a, as a, a term has been around for, for many years. The idea of, of working at this scale, of, at, at the nanometer scale, the 1 to 100 nanometer scale, is commonly now and probably rightly attributed to Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, who in a lecture in 1959 drew attention to the idea that there's plenty of room at the bottom. And what, what Feynman, and this is often quoted, and what Feynman meant by this was that if we think about the human scale, we're talking centimetres. So, so on a human scale, we typically work centimetres to metres, our biggest structures may be hundreds of metres. In, in dimensions. That means from, from what, we, what we perceive on a centimetre scale up to the biggest things that we typically build is about a factor of 100,000. What Feynman pointed out was that if you go down from the centimetre scale that we're all familiar with, down towards the atomic scale, you're going down seven orders of magnitude. So, so on a macroscopic scale, we maybe build things over four orders of magnitude. If we go down in size, we can build things over seven orders of magnitude. So there's much more scope for manipulating materials, generating structures, generating devices below the scale that we're all familiar with of centimetres. The term nanotechnology was introduced by Norio Taniguchi in the mid-70s. And we think of nanotechnology in terms, as I say, of a linear scale of somewhere between 1 and 100 nanometers. Okay. I pop this one. Those of us who have been through the research assessment exercise recently, uh, which is an exercise that all academics have to go through in order to uh, secure their academic funding, Part of the way we justify our research activity and the impact of our research is by citing what we consider to be our four most significant papers over the past five or seven years. Uh, this just shows citations to Feynman's 1959 paper on there's plenty of, the room, plenty of room at the bottom. It didn't really make an impact for some 40 years. In fact, the impact of Feynman's predictions, visions, uh, post-dated his death. And, and so in a research assessment exercise context, Feynman's seminal discussion of nanotechnology would be considered a failure. Uh, it wouldn't have even been returnable as a submission uh, because Richard Feynman died in the 1990s. But it has had a big impact. It's not often that papers are cited 50 or 60 years after their publication. And of course, what's happened is that that's excited a huge amount of interest. If you Google nanotechnology, you'll get about 12 and a half million hits. If you look more scholarly in, in things like web of knowledge, then, sorry, then you'll see that from, from a few hundred papers 10 years ago, there are now some five to 6,000 papers a year being published in the area of nanotechnology. So as an academic discipline, it's growing uh, dramatically, but it's also impinging on public uh, consciousness. There's a, a company, Nano Silver Clothing, um, which produces articles of clothing impregnated with nanoparticles of silver. 
uh, which is an antibacterial agent, so you can wear your underwear for a week uh, and, and still sit next to people on the tube without them moving away from you, uh, <laughs> uh, right through to extreme nanotech, which promises to uh, improve the, the shine on your car. So this idea of, of nanotechnology and nanotech has, has made it into the public consciousness in a big way, and it's considered new and, and whizzy. In fact, we've been doing nanotechnology. We've been manipulating materials on the nanoscale for, for well over a millennium without actually realizing it. So this is a stained glass window, classical medieval stained glass window. The deep red colors here come from nanoparticles of gold embedded in the glass. So the craft nanotechnologies of a millennium ago were based around an empirical understanding that you could change the color of the glass staining uh, simply by changing the way you treated the gold. What we now know is that what the craftsmen are doing are actually changing the size of these particles. Nanotechnology is all about size dependent properties and, and what a modern physicist would say is that the craftsmen were generating particles that had different interactions with light. We understand the physical basis of that. On the gold nanoparticles, the light interacts and generates these things called surface plasmons, which give rise to different absorption properties of the light. The difference between the craft nanotechnologies of a millennium ago and what we do now is that we understand this relationship between size and physical, chemical and biological properties. So it's moved from being a craft activity towards being an engineering discipline and a scientific discipline. Okay. Not many people can visualize a nanometer or a hundred nanometers. So I thought what I'd try and do is, is put this, this length scale in context, initially with some biological materials, uh, partly because Although I trained as a chemist, most of my career has been spent in, in, in biological and biomedical sciences. So the human hair is about 50 micrometers across, so 50, 50 microns across. If we think about a cancer cell, that's about 10 times smaller than the width of a human hair. So that's about 5 microns in diameter. The influenza virus is about 50 times smaller, down around now 100 nanometers. So, so the upper limit, if you like, of what we consider to be nanoscale science, nanotechnology, is the size of an, a single influenza virus. And if we go down another factor of 10 in size, we come down to these protein amyloid fibrils, which are produced in diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So, so we have biological properties. This is a, 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 about a, a, a thousand-fold range of, of 